That opened her eyes to the fact that there was more to all of this. Blood this and blood that prattle she'd been hearing from the boys, the sort of secret language her grandparents had used when they didn't want her to understand them. She told them they were being brainwashed, but that didn't mean much coming from someone who smoked crack, the very drug that gave the gangs their power. The boys loved their mother. They would later tell her one of the things that first attracted them to the gangs was the money so that they could buy her things. They'd offer her trips, cars, cash, anything but drugs. They wanted her off the drugs. Teresa realized her sons were right, not just for her sake, but for theirs. If she was going to talk to them, really talk to them, she was going to have to do so from a higher morale ground. So she stopped drinking, stopped smoking crack, and stopped smoking pot. She began going to church every day and started trying to really learn everything she could about this new type of game. The boys had been recruited by Raquel's boyfriend into the Crenshaw Mafia Gangster Bloods, run by the Lockets, a family of black brothers who immigrated from California and claimed Park Hill neighborhoods. But 2727 California was in the heart of the Crips territory, and the Crips were the arch enemies of the Bloods. That made her boys targets. Teresa discovered that the gang tended to recruit boys from families that had some means rather than the homeless or destitute. That way, if the boys were arrested, the parents could pay their bonds, or if the boys were ripped off for the drugs they were selling for the gangs, they could get their parents to make it up. This lesson she learned firsthand after Danny came to her begging for $700. He said he'd been ripped off and was in serious trouble with his gang if he couldn't come up with the money. She gave it to him, but said it would be the last time. Working at night, she found it even harder to keep track of her sons, especially Danny, who began staying out all night. He seemed to have given up on ever being anything but a gang member. he followed so far behind his classmates at school that he dropped out of 10th grade. Teresa would ask Antonio, who preferred to sleep in his own bed, where his brother was, but Antonio always said he didn't know. She didn't know what to do. She demanded that they stop using gang language in the house and refuse to let them listen to rap music that insulted women. How can you listen to that around me and your sister, she demanded. They really didn't have an answer other than that the music spoke to them about life on the streets. Things are different than when you were young, they would tell her. Always in the past, she'd been able to talk to her kids, but now all they did was spout gang rhetoric at her about corrupt cops shaking down gang members, the Brotherhood of Bloods, an us-against-the-world mentality backed by guns that was particularly frightening, and when Teresa learned her boys had earned the nicknames Bang and Boom, because those are the sounds guns make. Teresa realized she needed help as she was going to fight the gangs for her son. She began attending neighborhood meetings sponsored by the Reverend Leon Kelly, a former convict turned minister who was trying to educate the community about gangs. She says she went to every meeting through 1987 and quickly realized that everyone, including the police, especially the police, had no idea what to do about the problem, except the one officer who stood up at a meeting and said the department's idea of solution was to round them up, put them in the Mile High Stadium, and shoot them. It was a big joke, and some in the room even applauded, but Teresa was outraged. Quote, excuse me, but I'm the mother of two gang members, she said. Quote, these people, these Bloods and Crips, quote, moved into Denver and started recruiting our children with their money, and your solution is to corral and shoot them down? Los Angeles Police Department gang experts came to some of the meetings. They warned against going after the gang so hard that they scattered to the suburbs. They were almost apologetic, Teresa remembers, about a California program that allowed deferred sentences for gang members provided they leave the state. Many of them had wound up in Denver. The LA cops urged everyone at the meetings to learn from their mistakes, to give the kids options and alternatives while they were still young, but Denver was not listening. Teresa was often the only parent of gang members at these meetings, at least the only one who would admit it. She went to the homes of other parents whose children she knew to be at risk, but had doors literally and figuratively slammed in her face. She was ostracized in her own community. Her boys were gangsters and other families didn't want their children tainted. She moved to an apartment in Aurora, hoping the distance from 2727 California might make a difference. But the boys just drove to Park Hill and Danny often stayed with his grandmother who dotted on her grandmother. Teresa searched her son's room. When she found drugs, she flushed them down the toilet. When she found guns, she turned them over to Leon Kelly. Mom, you can't do that, the boys would complain. It's already done, she'd reply. Mom, you have to go back and get the gun from Reverend Kelly, they demand. No, she replied. If you want it, call him and ask for it back. The gun is gone. The drugs are gone. 
but even Reverend Kelly disappointed her. One day, he posed with gang members for a photograph that ran on the front page of the Rocky Mountain News to illustrate a story on Denver's growing gang problem. All the other gang members had their faces covered to disguise their identity, but there was Antonio, 13 years old, grinning for all the world to see. As she grew increasingly frustrated, Teresa began taking more chances. One day, she went to the Lockett's house in Park Hill to look for her sons. The mother told her they were at a house party three blocks away. As Teresa went up to that house, she saw a man being ushered out and money exchanging hands. She knew this was not a safe place to be, and she could see her sons and Pancho through the screen door. What the hell is going on, she demanded, opening the door and walking in. One of the lockets, his arms as big as hams, looked up in surprise from his chair. Crack cocaine was piled on a table in front of him. An assault rifle lay within easy reach. In fact, everywhere she looked, there were guns. Let's go, she said to her boys, and Francisco ignoring Lockett's scowl. Mom, her boys started to protest. Don't say a word, she said grim grimly. Go get in the car. For all their nicknames and growing reputation, Teresa's boys weren't about to ignore their mother when she was that angry. They got in the car and let her drive them home. When she got there, Teresa called the police and told them what she had seen. The Lockets were infamous. They had already had one home seized under public nuisance statutes for dealing crack. But the officer told her that while they were aware of the current situation, the police had rules they had to follow and the Lockets didn't. Teresa knew she was losing the war for her sons. Danny, in particular, believed and lived everything he was told by the other members of the CMG. They were family. The cops were the bad guys. Women were bitches and hoes. Only the bloods could be trusted. Finally, Teresa had heard enough and threw Danny out of the house. In the days that followed, she tried not to think about what he was doing how he was surviving. Then one evening, Antonio came to her and said, Mom, you have to go get him. Danny was living in a motel room on Colfax Avenue, a nine millimeter handgun on the nightstand, selling drugs for the gang. It was only a matter of time before the police or someone else got to him. Teresa wouldn't pick him up, but she told Antonio that Danny could come home. She had little hope that she could save Danny, but she still thought Antonio might make it. Her younger son had always had big plans. He was going to be an artist, attend college, maybe draw for Disney someday. He knew that to pursue those plans, he had to stay in school. That wasn't easy, especially because he too was proud of his gang affiliation. He'd get expelled for wearing red shoestrings or a red hat or for throwing gang signs, but he'd always come back and talk to his mother and say, tell them they have to let me back in, he'd insist, and soon Antonio would be back in the classroom. Antonio managed to stay out of trouble or any major trouble until a few days after his 15th birthday. But on March 26 of 1989, he shot another boy in the alley behind 2727 California. It was Easter Sunday, January 7th of 1998. Quote, when you hear what happened to Brandy Duvall, the way she was killed and the way she was raped, it is a natural human reaction to cry out for vengeance. Randy Canny faces the jury knowing that he is walking a tightrope on behalf of his client. A criminal defense lawyer for 10 years, Canny has never before had a first-degree murder case. He'd once plea bargained a death penalty case, a gang shooting down to 48 years. But this was different, very different. But there is only one defendant sitting here, Frank V. Hill Jr., quote-unquote, Canny says, pointing to his client, Frank V. Hill did not kill Brandy Duvall, and there is nothing in the evidence you will hear to suggest that he did. Jeff Cole, DA Dave Thomas, had opted not to seek the death penalty in this case, primarily because of V. Hill's age. But if Kenny lost, Frank would spend the rest of his life in prison. No parole and a life in a maximum security prison was a long, long time for someone not that yet, not that old enough to vote. Kenny had always wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer. He liked the idea of fighting for the underdog against the state. His first obligation was to make the state prosecutors prove their case, but he felt his job went further than that. It was up to him to paint the, his client as a human being, not a monster. And if the government's facts were overwhelming, to find mitigating factors that would explain why a 16-year-old boy would have participated in something so sick and so brutal. Circumstances. The word haunts Kenny. What circumstances led Frank Vigil to be in the house that night? Quote, Frank Vigil did not rape Brandy Duvall. There is no credible evidence that he had any sexual contact with her, he continues. It was Frank Vigil age at the first that struck Kenny when he was appointed to the case in June of 1997. After hearing some of what had happened to Brandy Duvall, he had expected to find some hardened gang member, but what he saw was a scared kid. 
it was even hard to deal with the family. Absolutely terrifying to speak to a mother who knew she would probably never see her teenage son in her home ever again. He had tried to find balance when talking to Sally Vigil, a balance that would offer some hope while also making it clear there wasn't much. And in his work in the courtroom would be another balancing act. What had happened to the girl was horrible. Kenny needed to convince the jury that Frank, as the smallest and youngest gang member present, was less involved and in fact afraid to speak up or try to stop the brutality. Quote, he was not the one who picked her up and brought her to the house, Kenny tells the jury. Quote, he was not the one who gave her cocaine. This was another fine line. His client was charged with first degree murder, sexual assault, sexual assault on a child, assault and kidnapping. Mere presence at the house wasn't enough to convict him of first degree murder. But if the jury believed Frank V. Hill had participated in any way in the felonies leading up to her death, the way Colorado, read, Colorado law read, he was just as guilty as whoever plunged the knife into her neck. Their only chance, he figured, was to attack the credibility of the defense's witness, particularly Uncle Joe and Zigzag. Both would claim that Frank had been the first to urge the others to silence Brandy by killing her. Kenny would have to impeach them as liars. Now, as he cautious, now as he cautions the jury that when prosecution presented his case to remember where it comes from, for the prosecution to say that these people are not angels makes them guilty of an unbelievable understatement. There is no physical evidence and no reliable witnesses that proves Frank V. Hill committed the crime. It was not some accident that the gang members showed up at Uncle Joe's that night, Kenny says. He is the uncle of Danny Martinez, who was on the run from the law, and he knew that. Nor was it the first time that a similar gang rape had taken place at the home of Uncle Joe. Quote, he got his cocaine from the gang. Jose Martinez's role bothered Canny's tremendously. So many adults could have stopped what happened to Brandy Duvall. The defendant's family, by keeping him away from bad influences, even the victim's family by insisting that a 14-year-old girl belonged at home in her bed instead of wandering the streets, although he couldn't say that in court without inviting a backlash from the jury. But Uncle Joe was there. He should have stopped him. Sammy Quintana was another Jim, admitting to some things but making everyone else look worse than himself. The prosecution says they'll be asking for 96 years. What they forgot to tell you, Candy says, letting a hint of sarcasm slip into his voice, was he could get as little as 48. Quintana, he notes, had killed two girls. In the summer of 1996, Sammy Quintana and a cohort set out to kill a drug snitch, Silvano Martinez, he explains. Instead, they shot an innocent girl, Venus Montoya. Kenny knew he would have to watch overplaying Quintana's gang activities, that could backfire since Frank hung around with these guys voluntarily. Circumstances again, the kid of a single mom, where was he going to find someone to look up to for strength and protection? It sure as hell wasn't the high school basketball coach. The other prosecution witnesses, Candy says, are all liars, all liars. When they had to point out a finger to save themselves, they pointed it at Frank V. Hill, the one they weren't afraid of. And there are two important witnesses the jurors will not hear from because they are also defendants, Candy points out. Danny Martinez Jr., the biggest boss, and Francisco Martinez, who was the sicker than anyone could imagine. Bang, Pancho, and Zigzag were all in their mid-twenties and larger than his client. Frank Vigil could not have stopped anyone. You remember that in your Voyeur Dior, I told you, my great fear was the sheer horror of what happened to Brandy Duvall would make you want to take it out on someone. Kenny says, laying it on thick now, quote, I trust you will not take it out on an innocent 16 year old who did not commit any crimes, end quote. Summer of 1998, Antonio Boom Martinez sits on his porch of 2727 California, a little white house with green trim, fondly looking over the neighborhood that he, his brothers, and Pancho claimed as their own. A floating boat in the middle of a sea of crypts, he said, as he remembered it. I love hanging out over there, he says. I knew we did a lot of bad shit, but I have a lot of good memories about the way things were. 23 years old, Antonio is short, barrel-chested, and thick-shouldered. His dark hair has been sworn to a boot camp stubble. Considering his tough reputation on these streets, his face can be surprisingly soft with large, doe-like eyes, long lashes, and a smile as white and perfect as a full moon. 
But when he's angry or simply recalling an event that made him angry, these eyes turn hard, almost brittle with suggested violence. The smile remains, but it loses its warmth and gains a ferocity. Maybe this was his face mask, something he puts on now that he's chosen to go defenseless in a world where some are still gunning at him. Maybe not. Antonio's hands, too, are softer than you would expect for a street gangster. But then he's an artist and his hands are his tools. When he talks about his wilder days, he holds his arms akimbo, his palms up and slightly curled as if loosely holding handguns. A gangster pose, he slips easily into the gang slang, profane, arrogant, more of the hooked on ebonics of black gangs than the slingshot slit of the old Cholo Mexican gangs. But when he talks about his art, or his daughter, or his girlfriend, or what he wants to do with his life, he is well-spoken and engaging. Confidence replaces arrogance. As he says with what his mother calls his Kool-Aid grin, quote, I can be pretty charming when I want to, especially with the girls. He's only a few months shy of graduating from the Colorado Institute of Art. As soon as he's out, he hopes to leave the state and its memories, good and bad, and head to a city further west where a friend has promised to set him up in the state-of-the-art tattoo studio. Antonio still considers himself a blood gang member. He's just no longer committing crimes. He's a hard-working, two-job-working, tax-paying citizen with big plans. He's getting on with life, but he can't leave all the memories behind. His earliest are being with his older brother, Danny, always together through the thick and thin. Once, when they were living with their mother in Bill Rollins in California apartment complex, Antonio was standing next to his brother while Danny threw rocks into the complex's whirlwind, clogging the drain. The manager appeared and, seizing the boys by their arms, dragged them home. Their stepfather apologized and said it wouldn't happen again. Then he spanked both boys. Although he had no part in the rock throwing, Antonio wouldn't snitch on his brother to escape punishment. That's the way we were, Antonio says. We always took our lickings together, except this time. Even if Antonio had told on his brother, he wouldn't be saying anything new. Although everyone loved Danny, they all knew he was a troublemaker. Quote, I used to steal playboys from my stepfather, says Antonio. I was only six or maybe seven, he laughs, but I had a thing for naked women. He hid the magazines under a toy box. Antonio came home from school one day and heard his mother talking to one of her friends on the telephone. He realized she found the magazines while cleaning his room. It has to be Danny, he heard her say. He's girl crazy. Danny never denied it. All of our lives, we took the blame for one another, for each other. Antonio says, we got into trouble together and we either got out of trouble together or we didn't get out of trouble, period, except this time. Thinking about where his brother is now, awaiting trial for first degree murder, Antonio grows silent, stepping away from the gang life when he saw the craziness escalating from one of the hardest things he'd ever have to do. Now he's tormented by the thought that if he stayed at Uncle Joe's that night, he might have saved them all. Maybe, maybe not. Growing up, Danny always wanted to be the leader. Quote, he was charismatic and had a good athlete. Antonio recalls, I always wanted to be with him. We'd be together so much that sometimes people thought we were twins. Although that was fine with Antonio, it was important to Danny that people knew he was the older of the two, that Antonio was his little brother, a tag along. When their mom and Bill broke up, Antonio was lost. Quote, he was the only dad I knew, he says. I liked him, but he had us call him Bill. He said, they know who their father is. One minute Bill was in my life. He was the guy who spanks you when you did something bad. The guy who buys you toys, who takes you fishing and sees that we have a place to live. Then he was gone and I didn't see him, to, I didn't see him no more. What kind of sense is that? With Bill gone, Danny became more than a big brother. Even though the boys were sent back to Denver to live with their father, Big Dan, who was living with his parents, Danny was my father, Antonio says. Antonio rarely spent any time with Big Dan. He'd come by and get Danny. I guess it was because he was Danny Jr. and sort of knew him before him and mom split up. Me, I was just some kid his old lady had after she left him. In some ways, it was depressing. He admits, quote, I used to wonder, how come I never get to go? But on the rare occasion when their father took both boys, Antonio would usually wonder why he wanted to go so desperately, quote, it wasn't like we get to be with just him, he recalls. There was always one of his girlfriends along and she was always a bitch to the kids. Danny always seemed to have fun with him, but I had more fun with my grandma and my grandpa. 
And there was always the material maternal grandmother at 2727 California to turn to. She spoiled the boys who could do no wrong. The only thing the boys didn't like was when she and other relatives would say mean things about their mother, how she wasn't a good mom. That made them cry. Antonio looks at the house. He notes that the row of bullet holes made when a rival gang fired an assault rifle have been well patched. You can hardly tell where they were, he says. Shit, we used to come out of the house some mornings and see a new hole and say, damn, I never even heard the shot. Guess we kind of got used to getting shot at. Antonio's first experience with gangs came when they were still living in California. Danny was in a breaking dance group that competed once a week at the local skating rink, and as usual, Antonio would tag along to watch. One weekend, their friends brought Willie, a black kid just out of juvenile hall. A red bandana protruded from Willie's backpack, but Antonio didn't know what it meant. Another team did, though. He went to call some crip friends, and he told them there was bloods in town. A little while later, several gangsters appeared in the parking lot. They showed us they showed the security guards they had a gun, and he came in. Didn't call the police, but told us, if you're smart, you'll stay inside. But Willie was already outside, checking out the action. Realizing the spot he was in, he took off across the street in the park to a parking lot. Someone let off a shot, Antonio says. It was his first taste of gunfire. Quote, Danny and me and our friends were scared, he recalls. We didn't want to go outside, but we knew we would eventually have to leave, so we went together. On the way home, they ran across a terrorized but safe Willie. I was thinking, over a red rag? They'll come down here and shoot someone over the color of their bandana? What kind of fucking sense does that make? By the time the boys got back to Denver, the gangs were here too, and they really started looking good when Teresa moved back home, hooked on drugs. Quote, life got really shitty, Antonio says. She'd make dinner and clean the house, but that was about it. I realized that if I wanted something, I was going to have to get it on my own. A, psych a psychologist would one day say that Antonio got involved in gangs because of the repressed anger over his mother abandoning him. Quote, it wasn't true, he says. Quote, she was absent a lot of it, but we made our own choices because it seemed like fun. By the time she knew what was going on, we were too far gone. I guess I was like any other 13 or 14 year old. You couldn't tell me shit. She tried to tell us what we were doing was wrong, but I was like, you ain't been living right all your life. Don't tell me how to live mine. Gang activity was still pretty loose, Antonio remembers. The neighborhoods in Denver weren't saturated with gangs, or at least they weren't in control. They were pretty scattered, even on the east side in Park Hill. Fuller Park was the only really established gang territory. Park Hill wasn't consolidated by the CMG Bloods until 1987. That was the year that Danny and Antonio officially joined the gang. But because their sister was dating a blood and because they were Mexican kids, they already been having constant run-ins with the older Crips and younger Crip wannabes. The cops were no help. Quote, they wrote us off, Antonio says bitterly. The police knew I was in trouble when I was 12, but none of the motherfuckers would help. Not even offer a ride. No one. Hey, I'll watch your back so you can get to school or go back safe. Antonio shrugs. It probably wouldn't have made a difference, but hey, they didn't even try. If they had tried, then maybe some years later, I wouldn't have been able to say, yeah, there was someone who cared, but I can't. The way he explains it, he practically joined the Bloods out of spite. When he was 12, Antonio's favorite football player was Brian Bosworth, who played for the University of Oklahoma. The school's colors were white and red. For Christmas that year, a relative brought him a red jersey with Bosworth's number on it. He probably wore it to school. Quote, the Crips were all over me because I liked a particular player who went to school that wore that color, he recalls. I decided, too bad. I didn't feel like I should have to explain why I was wearing a jersey with red on it. I told them, fuck you. I don't like you anyways. After that, joining the Bloods and wearing a red bandana was easy. When she found out we were in a gang, mom freaked out, Antonio remembers. But we had been around drugs and guns and crime all our lives, except when we were with Bill. But she got scared because now we were in it. She was terrified that her sons were now part of all of this. Antonio's mom wasn't the only one who worried. Their cousin Sammy Quintana was no longer allowed to visit or spend the night. His parents had built a nice, comfortable life for themselves and their kids, and they didn't want Sammy, a soccer star at school, hanging around with troublemakers. One day, Sam Quintana Sr. gave Danny and Antonio a warning, quote, If I ever see you at my jail, you better act like you don't know me because that's where you're headed. 
If they don't have Sammy for company anymore, the brothers found someone they liked even better, Francisco Martinez. He liked hanging around us because girls were always coming over to see Raquel or me or Danny, Antonio says. He hardly ever went home. Sometimes his mom would get the police to pick him up. He'd go home only long enough to shower and change his clothes, and then he'd be right back. Quote, he was always straight up with me and Danny. He would tell you exactly what he thought and never lied, Antonio remembers, except to girls. The brothers never begrudged Sammy all his advantages. Quote, but we had nothing better to do than be bad, Antonio says, and then he laughs. Even his heroes weren't the regular sort. Quote, I used to tell my mom that I wanted to grow up to be a hitman. I fantasized the whole gangster life. I read books about Lucky Luciano, Al Capone, and Carl Scambino. They were my idols, but I wasn't Italian, so I couldn't be in the mob. So I did the next thing closest thing I did was join a street gang. Antonio and Danny had been in the gang only two weeks when they were given their first gun, a 22 caliber pistol. We convinced them that we were willing to use it and they were just as enthused. Hey, some juveniles willing to shoot? The violence in Denver was just starting to surface. I think we had a lot to do with that. Antonio says with pride, quote, part of it was putting on a show. We were always smaller than the other boys, but we would fight and now we could back it up with a gun. We got a reputation of being willing to shoot. Standing in the front yard of an old gang battle zone, Antonio strikes a gangster pose, quote, if you're not willing to shoot, then get out of my face, he tells an imaginary enemy, because I will kill you and I don't care. I got nothing going for me. The boys were, quote, beat in to the gang after their first couple of drive-by shootings. It was pretty mellow, Antonio says. I didn't get the ass whooping I should have and have given it to others myself. They already had their nicknames, bang and boom, because that's the sound of a gun makes, he says. Quote, we already proved to ourselves as soldiers willing to be violent and down for a cause, willing to do dirt and including shooting people. But there was more to it than gunplay. In California, they seen older kids who had things, cars, money, and girls because they were dealing drugs. They wanted some of that for themselves and also to buy their mother the things she could never afford. Not that she'd take them once she knew the boys were in the gang, though. The CMG leadership started giving the Martinez brothers drugs to deal. They defended their turf with bravado and bullets. Quote, you could come buy everything from us, he says, but otherwise you were not welcome on our block. Everyone else was older and bigger, but the word was out that them little fucking Mexican kids had guns and would shoot. I wasn't stupid about it, he says. I mean, I've seen guys who get all macho and shit and stand there in the middle of the fucking street, guns blazing away like they think they're fucking John Wayne or something. Those guys usually leave in an ambulance. Quote, I didn't want to get shot. I might have placed myself in the position to get shot, but when I heard a gun go off, I ducked and I lived to fight another day. The brother's reputation grew to the point that every time there was a shooting in the neighborhood, the police blamed it on bang and boom. Sometimes it wasn't even us that did it, Antonio says and grins. He kind of became established as the usual suspects. It was a big, dangerous gang, and they were never caught until Easter, Sunday, 1989. Raquel, Antonio, and their mother went over to 2727 California to take their grandmother on a picnic. Danny was already living there most of the time. Pancho had dropped by, and he and Antonio were standing in the alley behind the house when they saw three Crips approaching. The Crips usually knew better than to walk through the boys' neighborhood. These three later told police that they were late to a picnic themselves and taking a shortcut. But to Antonio, they didn't seem to be in a hurry to get somewhere else. They came looking for trouble and they found it. The boys flashed gang signs at each other, a challenge. The three Crips were older and bigger and Danny was in the house, but the two other held their ground. They were talking shit, Antonio recalls, walking over to the saw yard to reenact with the drama. Quote, one put his hand under a baggy t-shirt he was wearing up near his waistband as if he had a gun. Well, I had a 45 stashed under the trash dumpster, he says, pointing to where a dumpster still stands. So I bent over and got, a, got the gun, he says. Yeah, motherfucker, what's up? You think this is a game? Well, if you're carrying, pull your strap and make this gun fight. I like that better. And they took off running. One of the Crips was trying to climb over a fence when Antonio pointed the gun at him. I didn't aim. I just let off a shot. Antonio giggles at the memory, quote, he caught a hot one in the ass. The police arrive and force Antonio and Pancho to the ground, stepping on their necks to keep them from moving as they press the shotgun against their skulls. They drag Danny out of the house while photographers snapped away. 
Danny's photograph would appear to the front page of the Rocky Mountain News the next morning, even though the police said they had already released him by then. Antonio and Pancho were not so lucky. Quote, to me, I thought it was cool, Antonio says. I didn't care about the arrest. I knew it sounds stupid now, but I was excited it was going to be on the news and everyone knew I shot a crab. It got less exciting fast when Antonio learned that he might be tried as an adult and could face as much as 40 years in prison. Quote, I thought gangs were cool, he says. I got so involved, I was so deep, and when it stopped being cool, there was no way out. He stops, watches a car with tinted windows drive by. Only after it's gone does he relax. Quote, my mom and grandma prayed a lot for Danny and me. January 7th of 1998. Quote, the people call Angela Metzler. At those words, the prosecutor, Mark Randall, Angela rises from her seat in the spectator gallery and makes her way up to the witness stand. She raises her right hand and swears to tell the truth. She is wearing a black dress, a reminder to everyone in the courtroom that she is still in mourning. How is it that you know Brandy Duvall, Randall asks. Brandy's my daughter, she replies, using the past tense. Quote, can you give us her full name and date of birth? It's Brandilyn Rose Duvall. She was born July 28th of 1982. Randall holds up a photograph and asks Angela to identify the girl pictured in it. It's Brandy, she says quietly, as the first tear on her cheek appears. On May 30th, 1997, Brandy was real excited about moving with her mom to a new apartment the next day. Quote, how did Brandy travel, Randall asked, by bus, or she would call me or my brother or her brother, someone to come get her, she replies, but most of the time by bus. Would days go by where you would not hear from her, Randall asked? Never, Angela replies. Usually no more than an hour or two would go by without Brandy checking in. Was she really in the habit of staying out all night, he asked? Rarely. She liked to sleep at home. Brandy had, Brandy had paged me that afternoon, soon after Angela got off work. She wanted to go shopping at the mall and needed money. They met two blocks from Angela's mother's house. Quote, she was very happy. She looked beautiful. Now the tears really began. After Angela gave her the money, Brandy had reached into her uncle's car and grabbed me around the neck real hard and said, thanks, mom. Angela tries to continue, but she can't speak. She takes a moment, then goes on. I said, you're welcome, baby. Brandy started to walk away, but suddenly turned back. I love you, mom. I love you, uncle. She was bouncy and in a good mood. Angela takes a deep breath. It was the last time I ever seen her again. At the defense table, Frank Vigil looks up briefly, then back at the table. Spectators are sniffling on the other side of the aisle. Brandy's grandmother, Rose, is crying, her thin shoulders shaking. Randall asks how Brandy was dressed. He needs Angela to explain why her daughter was wearing a red basketball jersey that might attract gang members like sharks to blood. Her daughter liked to play basketball, she explains, and Michael Jordan was her idol. She got the shirt from her dad, who lives in Phoenix. Quote, when did you think something was wrong, Randall asks. The next day, Angela had tried to page her daughter, but there was no response. She tried friends, but no one knew where Brandy was. At last, 24 hours, she had last seen her. Angela had reported her daughter missing to the police in Jefferson County and Denver. The next morning, Sunday, the newspapers had an article about an unidentified body found in Clear Creek. Angela had called the Jeffco coroner. After she described Brandy, she was told to come down to the office. With fear clutching at her like a drowning man, she arrived at the coroner's office. Quote, they told me to come downstairs where they showed me her jewelry. Randall holds up a plastic baggie and holds it to Angela. She opens it and takes out a ring, tries it on. It's a B ring, she says at last, her voice quivering. She never took it off. It's the first time she's seen it since that terrible day at the coroner's office. When she saw it, then she hoped against hope that her daughter had been robbed, that whoever waited to be identified had stolen these things from her daughter. But then they had taken Angela to another room and asked her to look through a glass portion a body bag was unzipped. A face was revealed. Wake up, baby. Wake up, baby, she yelled. Who did you see? Randall asked as gently as a question could be asked. It was Brandy, she says, weeping. Randall takes his seat. Kenny has no more questions. A mother's grief is left to wash back and forth across the silent courtroom like a scream off a canyon wall. On the morning of May 7th, the courtroom filled quickly as everyone waited for the judges to deliver their verdict. Angela Metzler was sat behind the prosecution table numb. Although she didn't believe that Danny would get the death penalty, the thought didn't disappoint her. She knew that he would spend his life behind bars. 
and her heart went out to, to, to Teresa Swindleton, Danny's mother, who was losing her child too. She had been upset with the defense attorneys had attacked Swinson as if what happened to Brandy had been her fault. Danny Martinez was a grown man who made all his own choices. Behind the defense table, Swinton fought to control her fear. When called by the defense to testify, she'd taken the opportunity to apologize to the mother of Brandy and the rest of Brandy's family. Now all her thoughts were on her firstborn. Please don't let them kill my son, she prayed. The judges came into the courtroom and Anderson wanted the standing by room only. The courtroom was packed again on May 27th when the judges announced their verdict. They had all accepted all five aggravators while agreeing to just one catch. All mitigator that this defendant did, did endure a difficult, disturbing, and unsettled childhood. They easily determined that the aggravator outweighed the mitigators and so had proceeded to the fourth step. Quote, in nearly 50 years of collective judicial experience, this panel has never dealt with a more shocking display of consequencelessness, depravity than that the defendant here is noted. The judge wrote that their sentencing order, while the panel acknowledged that many aspects of the defendant's childhood were very disturbing to this panel, nothing in that childhood adequately explains the man he has become. Then Villiano pronounced the verdict. It is the judgment, sentence, and the warrant of the court that the defendant, Francisco Martinez Jr., be delivered to the executive director of the Colorado Department of Corrections to suffer the penalty of death by lethal injection. After court was adjourned, the DA Thomas said quietly, this is society's way of defending itself. For public consumption, Kaplan had committed previously that the death penalty should be reserved only for the worst of the worst, but that wasn't really where he stood. I don't think anyone deserves to die, he said after the verdict was read, quote, this whole event started with an act of violence and now it's ending with an act of violence. But not all defense lawyers were upset by the verdict, quote, it's our society is going to have to have the death penalty, attorney Scott Robbins told a reporter. It needs to be imposed in appropriate cases, and certainly the facts in the Duval murders are pretty horrendous. Craig Silverman, who helped put Frank Rodriguez on death row, had a run against Denver D.A. Ritter in 1996, criticizing his boss for not being aggressive enough in pursuing the death penalty. Now in private practice, Silverman noted that Francisco Martinez fit the profile of the men already on death row. Quote, this verdict is completely consistent with the people who have traditionally been sentenced to death in Colorado. He told the Rocky Mountain News, quote, most of them were convicted of kidnapping, raping, torturing, and murdering innocent women. Killing multiple people will get you there too. Apparently, judges are making the distinction between the crime and the defendant and the facts. Legal analyst Andrew Cohen told the Denver Post, quote, if only one four is going to be a render a death verdict, it seems there are a safeguard in place. Judges don't seem to be rushing defendants to death. Angela, the mother of Brandy, didn't care about legal arguments. Quote, this doesn't lessen my pain. No, the mother said. It would be nice if any of these sentencing all these years, even the death penalty would bring Brandy back, but that can't happen. She hadn't supported the death penalty before her daughter's murder, and she'd been ambient when the DA decided to pursue it for Danny Martinez and Francisco Martinez. She did not plan to attend the later execution. It's nothing. I want to see, she said. It would not bring me any kind of satisfaction to see anyone else die. I'm not like that. I don't think we'd find any joy in watching a man die, even if he did kill my daughter. So now, death row has a new tenant, and three more men face the death penalty hearings in the coming months. Because Jose Martinez had led the police to Brandy's murderers, he was exempt from prosecution and entered the witness protection program. Jacob Casaditos pled guilty to sexual assault in exchange for the murder charges against him being dropped, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Both Maurice and David Warren also made plea deals with the government and received prison sentences ranging from 10 to 15 years. All three men have since been released from the Colorado Department of Corrections. Sammy Quintana, faced with the prospect of death penalty and facing additional charges for a separate unrelated murder, agreed to testify against Francisco Martinez and Dan Danny Martinez in exchange for a sentence of 96 years. Quintana now goes by the name of Sonny Tafoya and is incarcerated in an out-of-state prison. Frank Vigil, the youngest of the defendants, was convicted of capital murder in 1998 for his role in the killing of Brady Duvall. At the age of 16, Vigil was too young to face execution in Colorado, so the court sentenced him to life without parole. He is currently incarcerated at the Arkansas Valley Correctional Facility in Ordway, Colorado.
The trial of Francisco Martinez finally began in August of 1998. Francisco was arrogant, cocky, and rude during his trial and showed not a sheer tear of remorse for his actions. Throughout the trial, he mouthed the words F you to Brandy Duvall's grieving family as he smirked and laughed. Despite his lawyer's attempt to shift the blame to Danny Martinez, the jury was not swayed, and Francisco's behavior and complete lack of remorse told a different story than the one the defense was trying to portray. The jury took less than three hours to find Francisco Martinez guilty of murder. Francisco's fate was now in the hands of three judge panel. The panel noted that even for gang members, Francisco went above and beyond uh, the scale of barbarity for anyone that they have seen. It didn't take long for the three judges to reach a verdict. Francisco Martinez would die for his crime. On May 27, 1999, the panel unanimously voted to sentence Francisco Martinez Jr. to death by lethal injection for the murder of Brandy Duvall. In nearly 50 years of collective judicial experience, the panel has never dealt with a more shocking display. That same day, Danny Martinez narrowly avoided the death penalty by a single vote and was sentenced to life without parole for his role in the murder. Danny Martinez is currently serving his life sentence out of state as part of an interstate prisoner compact arranged with the Colorado Department of Corrections. Brandy Duvall's murderers are very much alive, and with Francisco Martinez, Samuel Quintana, and Frank Vigil all continuing to file appeals of their sentence or complaints about their prison conditions, their appeals cost the taxpayer millions of dollars, and yet the crime they committed has almost been completely forgotten. Virtually no one remembers the ruthlessness, brutality, and lack of mercy these killers showed when they committed their awful crime that night. No segments on 60 Minutes, no special reports on CNN, NBC, ABC, or any other mainstream can be seen about this case being talked about. Today, the creek in the mountains where Brandy Duvall bled to death is marked by a steel cross. Erected by her family, the cross bears Brandy's name and is decorated with colorful necklaces, flowers, and stuffed animals. After her death, Brandy's boyfriend, who had given her a rose just before her death, wrote her a beautiful poem. In February of 2003, the Colorado court sided with the appellants and overturned the death sentences of two Colorado inmates who were supposed to be sentenced to death by judge panels. The two inmates were retroactively sentenced to life without parole. One of the inmates was George Waldit, a convicted rapist and murderer, con condemned to death in 1997. The other inmate was, other than, was no other than Francisco Martinez Jr. Angela, Brandy's mother, whose life had been torn apart by grief and depression since her daughter's death, died five years later from cancer, aged just 51. However, Francisco Martinez, now 46 years old, is still very much alive and serving his life sentence at the Colorado Territorial Correctional Facility. And although he will never be released, he successfully avoided the punishment he very much deserves. Wow, that is a deep, deep story right there. Y'all tell me what y'all think down there in them comments, man. This stuff is crazy right here. Terrible. And to think about this, these are supposed to be reputable gangsters right here. Like where did where they like what do you, what even goes through your head? Like how does this even happen? You know, I can't even can't even make no sense of it. But uh, you know, if y'all made it this far through, man, hit your, hit your boy with a like, hit that like button on this video. Let me get out there in the algorithm. And if you ain't subscribed, subscribe because this is the type of stuff I be coming with all the time.